Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about composition, specifically basing composition and how you can use position lines and and sort of the illusion of movement to create some visual interest on your base. Uh, I think oftentimes with gaming miniatures they tend to feel very static. We tend to have them in the center of you know sort of the their base, be it square or circle. But uh, there, I think there are lots of opportunities to play around with positioning, with the lines, with the effects on your base, to, to really do something more interesting. Uh, and even though you might not do it with every fig, you can do it with some of the figs, and it can both change the way you think about individuals, characters, units, the whole thing. So, uh, we're not going to talk about position or composition of the figure itself and its movement. We're more looking at the way you place it on the base in this one. All right? Okay, let's get into it. So, as I said, um, the, the standard sort of arrangement for gaming figures is they tend to be pretty static, pretty standing in the center of a base, and they're just sort of there, right? And there's some dirt or some grass or there's something like that, and they're just kind of in the middle of the world that they occupy being that base. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Um, like, this is a perfectly acceptable way to base a figure. Um, and I think most figures, even if you think about the, the sort of things I'm going to say here, will still end up being based like this. And that looks fine, okay? But what I'm going to talk about is some ways we have some opportunities to make this a little more visually interesting based on the way we compose the figure, the base, and the sort of universe it inhabits, okay? So let's, let's look at some examples. So the first thing we have is vertical variation. And this is something I'm a big proponent of. Um, the, the base itself doesn't need to be a single flat thing. The world is full of vertical variation, like literally everywhere when you walk outside, unless you're on a flat road, okay, like something that's been paved. Most of the world is actually pretty bumpy. It's pretty hilly. There are rocks and trees and all, and you know, little hills and big hills and all sorts of ways that the world goes up and down as well as forward and backward, I suppose, right? So I, I think you can't be afraid to bring some of that vertical variation uh, into your miniatures. So here I've got my Skaven Death Runner I did for Silver Tower. I wanted him up on something, uh, especially given his position. And so I tried to create the triangle. Triangles are very important. Human beings like triangles. They tend to be visually appealing. We talk about that a lot in composition of the, of color theory and such. Uh, in this case, the triangle that's made is with the angle of the rock he's on and then him leaning forward. And that creates the sort of isosceles triangle of the miniature. Makes it more visually interesting. Makes him more interesting. Makes his pose look like he's really up and about ready to leap into battle. So. You can do this with a single figure. Now, this is a big giant rock he's on. I turned this fig into something that's like three and a half inches tall. But certainly this would be great for something like your character if you've got a main assassin or something. This can be a great way to make him stand apart uh, from all the rest of your figures. Can especially be true in something like Clan Eshin where you know, you've got a bunch of dudes who are basically just guy rats in pajamas. And so having one that's up leaping up on a rock, something like that to make him stand out, can make that model much easier to sort of identify. Our next option is when we talk about vertical variation in units, uh, and we're going to talk about that in a couple different ways. So here we've got flying models. Flying models are really always the easiest. These are some prosecutors, obviously. And I love flying models because I always like to do this different sort of positioning thing where you have them at different heights, balancing on different rocks. Again, you can see the guy in the back we're doing the triangle thing again with because that rock is leaning backwards. Um, I try to always have them at some kind of, of angle or something like that in most cases where they seem to, it creates that sort of illusion of movement. We'll talk about that more later. Um, this can be great for a couple reasons. Uh, vertical variation in your flying units is useful because most flying units have big, giant, annoying wings and don't actually want to stand next to each other. This was always the problem with, like, Bretonian Pegasus Knights, if you ever played with those and tried to put them on square bases in a unit. Um, boy, did those not want to sit together. Um, but vertical variation can solve that problem because you can have them at, at varying heights to the point where they will sit next to each other without their, and their wings will just overlap. 
Um, so, and this can be a great way to make the unit look more interesting uh, because, you know, things that are flying tend to be flying at different heights. They don't tend to all get at the exact same vertical alt altitude. And this creates that illusion of height. Now, even if your unit doesn't fly, we can still do it even in our units that are bigger. Now, here I have five figures, but you could do this in a unit of 40. And I think this is actually something that most people don't think about when they do their big units, uh, especially if you're doing like a rank and flank game. I think this can be incredibly important. Take some of the figs, some number. Let's say you got 40 guys. Let's take 10 of them. And amongst that 10, put them on different height, a variety of height rocks or something. Um, so there is a vertical variation with... Next up, we're going to talk about movement or more the illusion of movement. Um, those boats are not moving, <laughs> like at this moment, right? I mean, I'm sure in reality they were moving when this picture was taken. But uh, at this moment, you're looking at them. They're a static image, right? But yet they the illusion of movement is created and boats always do this like you're you, when you see advertising images for boats they're almost never in just sitting in dock or something they're always out on the water moving because it wants to create the illusion that it's movement you can get out there you can explore the ocean and they've really pushed it here uh, because they have the three boats lined up which moves your eye across they put the the black boat in the lead which is no accident um, somebody really composed this picture well Water, shooting on the water with boats is also cheating because that it leaves wake. You know, if you walk down the street, there's no wake left behind you, but boats leave a nice wake that um, directly shows and implies movement. Um, so this kind of thing is something we can bring over into our models as well. Now, certainly we could do it if we were if we did some water basing and we could create some wake, but oftentimes we don't have that kind of luxury, right? So, so how do we bring it into a base? Well, the first thing we can do is we can think about the way that the fig is sort of posed on the base. So in this case, I repose this tree lord to look like he's running. And then most importantly, I put him way up at the front of the base. Okay, so he's in the, look at his foot. He's not standing in the center of the base. He isn't, his foot isn't coming down there. He's right up kissing the edge of that rock as though he's about to leap. Things that are forward on their bases are going to feel like they're coming at you. It creates the illusion of aggressive movement. They're running forward. They're moving towards you. Things that are at the back of the base, if I had put his foot down sort of at the back of the base, he'd probably feel off balance because he's got so much hanging out behind him with his leg up in the air. But moreover, it creates the illusion of chasing something. Okay? So when you're doing, if you're doing a diorama of a hunt, or you have, you know, something like that. Putting the models at the back of the space so they've got a bunch of room to move in the base, in the universe you've created, that creates that illusion of they're hunting, they're after something, they're chasing something. That's the feeling. They're coming into frame is effectively what's happening, right? And they have a lot of room to explore. Um, so where your model is placed on the base and how it's sort of positioned there, how much room it has to move, um, can make a big deal in the feeling of it. Now, a lot of this isn't something people consciously realize. It's more just the subconscious feeling that you get, but that's what's going on. And if you stopped and sort of thought about it when you see these things, you, you'd kind of get that impression. But most of the time, these are all subconscious sort of hits. Now. The other thing we can do to create movement is, again, we can think about how the figure is placed in response to where it needs to move. So here is uh, my Red Riding Hood uh, from Kabuki that I converted for ReaperCon last year. And you can see here that she's on the very front corner of this display base. And the reason was because I wanted her, I thought the image looked like she was sort of looking back before she headed into the woods. And so the trees are on the base and then the background image is painted to be you know more trees she has to go through the woods right um and that's sort of what we're trying to create here of, of the sun is setting she stands on the edge of the woods look, looks back once more and is ready to go into the deep dark forest right and so by placing her up front as opposed to dead in the center i can create that illusion that she's not yet in the woods and is about to walk into them and if you kind of rotate the image around, I also painted a wolf like peeking out from behind one of the trees. So he's in there uh, waiting on her. 
But the point is, is that giving your figure room to move on the base, especially if they're placed to be taking advantage of that movement, that is to say if they're in a pose where they look like they're moving and not just standing static, which a lot of figures are, I think of like witch elves from the, you know, the dark elves or something like that. Um, those figures are in, in massive position, right? So getting them in different points on the face, looking that can, can change the feeling of the model. Is it coming into frame and about to leap forward? Is it over the edge of the base and about to leap at you? There's a, there's a big difference in the feeling there. Okay. All right. So we can create the illusion of movement based on how we're placed on the, the sort of basing that we have. And you can see I've got, got both a display base and a gaming base here. You can use, do it with both. It's about having that room to move as opposed to just being sort of static in the center of whatever base you've got. All right, so now let's talk about balance and position. And position is very much related to the illusion of movement, but it's, it's a little different. So first of all, balance. Um, when you're thinking about the balance of your figure, again, when you place a figure square stock in the center of the base, it tends to sort of auto balance. That, not, my, that might not always be what you're trying to achieve. These sort of concepts tend to be a little more important for display basing than they are for or competition than they are for gaming pieces, but it's still something you can think about. So on the left is my piece, uh, Grief, from uh, again from, from ReaperCon last year. And uh, with Grief, I saw this image as this warrior had lost someone, you know, very long ago, because the tombstone is, you know, heavily weathered, but this pain has never really faded. And so if we bring in the center line of that piece, okay, that's the center line of the piece. Look how much weight is on the left side of this image. Between the moon, the tree, and her, everything is over on the left side, right? And the right side of the image is very sparse and empty. It's the tombstone. Now there is the tree there, obviously. It can't be nothing. It would feel a little too unbalanced. But there's much less on the right than on the left. And that was an intentional choice because in the emotion of the piece, this warrior has lost someone, right? And so you want to create the illusion that there is an emptiness there that represents her loss. And so the right side of the base, which represents the person who died, is relatively empty. Now, again, here we're really talking about those sort of subconscious effects. Um, but I think there, those kinds of things can separate it. When you look at a piece and it hits you emotionally, it's these kinds of elements that you can use to build that emotion, to build that resonance, to make sure it lands, okay? So that's why I weighted everything to the left side of the piece here, because I wanted all the weight to be still with her, who's alive, and there to be a void and emptiness for what she lost on the other side, okay? Um, so I purposefully imbalanced the piece. Now, in the case of CoverGirl over on the right, uh, the wonderful Canonist Viridian from, uh, the, that I did to be based on the John Blanche art, um, this is a case where I wanted her to walk up all the way forward. She walked out of that frame and she came straight at you, stopped at the edge of her universe and struck a pose, right? She probably just shot a dude because the gun is smoking. And so... Uh, hence why she's way up on the front of the base. Like, she's as front as she can be without tipping off the edge, right? Because if I had placed her in the middle, which I could have, it wouldn't be as forward. She wouldn't, it wouldn't feel as aggressive, right? Her position is a naturally aggressive position. Now, here I'm not creating any illusion of movement other than the fact that she covered the space. She's not going anywhere at this moment. In fact, she's in a very much, like, vogue, strike a pose kind of stance, right? But the point of it was the position that she's in. She's in this very aggressive Captain Morgan stance. And so to match that, I wanted her way up on the front of the base. So that aggression comes forward, right? She marched off out of that cover, shot somebody, and then struck the pose and is like, what? And that's what putting her on the front of the base creates. Again, it's a subtle effect, okay? But I think it can be very impactful to the way that we perceive and the way we feel about the piece overall. So that's balance and position. So our final thing we're going to talk about is leading lines. Um, leading lines are something that you see often in car advertisements. 
because they're free. They car advertisements are cheap. They have lines in the road that they can use to do this. Now, this image is a bit of Photoshop trickery, okay? Cameras are really fast. And and we don't think about it, but we're being emotionally manipulated here. You can find this image without the Photoshop blur. This car is not moving so fast that the camera wasn't able to catch the background of the blur. That wouldn't even make sense anyways. This is a Photoshop effect, okay? Um, cameras take pictures really well. This car is going, you know, some number of miles an hour. A camera can certainly snap that quick. So, especially the extremely high-end cameras they use to photograph cars. Um, so, but they've blurred it intentionally to create the image. Notice how the car is crisp, perfectly clean, but the background image is blurred, and the only thing that's solid are the lines, right? So look at these leading lines. Let's take a look. They have, this is a wonderful image because they even had this extra shadow. Like, I'm guessing the photographer was just so excited when they found this shadow being cast on the on the sort of embankment on the other side because it creates a second leading line around the car, funneling the car forward into the future. Notice how the car is placed toward the back of the image, like we've talked about. It's got room to move down the road. You're going, you're exploring, you're hitting that open road, and you're doing it fast because there's this blur effect. And where are we going? We're going into the future, right? These lines lead off and into the horizon. This is all the stuff that's being not so subtly communicated here, okay? Now, again, in our miniatures, we don't necessarily have a background, but we have a base, right? And that tends to be our, our world that we get to construct these sorts of lines with. So here's an example of a gaming miniature that I construct these leading lines with. Now, what I this piece is my Celestin Prime. This is uh, Guillaume Le Breton rising out of his grave to return as the Celestin, as a new Celestin Prime to, to fight for Sigmar in the New Age. So, I purposely placed him askew like this. Like, notice how he's askew to the mausoleum. That is to say, the mausoleum isn't straight ahead, and then he's straight over top of it. I certainly could have. But I, the lines I wanted to create, I wanted it to be broader. If I used the front angle of the church, I felt it was too thin. Whereas with the back, I could create these lines. Okay? I widened out the the triangle on the base by turning it sideways, okay? So I was using the back of the mausoleum and the front right side to balance the weight of the leading lines on the top. And here the lines are with both the basing element and then the miniature itself. So when I positioned the wings, I wanted them at roughly the same angle as the triangle down below. So what we get is a triangle that comes up into a point in the middle of the cloak and then folds out, creating the illusion. The leading lines here are the miniature and the, the base, and it creates the illusion that this fig is rising upward, right? So we get that the lines are creating the movement in this case, right? And giving us the, the sort of feeling that this guy is rising up in the air. Um, the other thing was the cloak here. That cloak is actually, it's, it's from um, one of the Raging Heroes figs, but it's actually upside down. Like on the normal model, that part isn't, it isn't shaped like that. It's actually the other way around. But I wanted it to go to the point because, again, I wanted that middle to be very, very thin so that that way we created that illusion of the funnel, right? It's sort of a, an hourglass where it comes together and then branches back out and creates that illusion of updraft, of upward momentum because of the leading lines. So you can do that a lot with your, you can think about your leading lines when you have your base. This is something you can really do. By the way, you can really cheat this with vehicles in games like Infinity and 40K and stuff. If you have a big base or you're flying planes in those games, like your super heavies. If you have a base uh, in a future game, you can use these same tricks uh, as with the car advertisement. Like you can paint roads <laughs> and create lines and stuff in the roads. I, I've seen people do this a lot with Infinity miniatures. Um, big Gundam miniature, stuff like that. Um, you can actually create road lines and create the illusion of movement. So, um, you know, if you can work hard, real lines organically into your piece in sort of futuristic or sci-fi stuff, uh, it's a good trick because you really can then create the image that this thing is tearing down the road or has room to move. You know, if you take your your vehicle, your tank, your your uh, your bikers, your whatever. Um, and you place them toward the back of the miniature and you create some lines of them ripping forward around the miniature, you can create those leading lines 
that show where this thing is going. It's going fast. Here it is. It's ripping across this, this space. So even in the smaller universe we have to work with of our bases, there's often space where we can use these sorts of tricks. Okay? And, and so it kind of brings it all together. You can see um, the vertical movement here. I, I've used verticality, right, in the mausoleum. I've used movement through the leading lines to create the illusion of movement and the positioning of the figure being way up and above uh, the actual stuff to create this angelic sort of positioning. So you bring all of it together or, or some of it in some of your figs. It often works best with things like this where you've got a single character, a centerpiece, big monsters, big planes and tanks. You know, with your units, you probably don't have to worry about as much. If you got 40 guys, that's okay. You probably don't need to worry about much of the stuff with them. They'll all do their own job of looking interesting. Maybe just a little vertical variation in, you know, model to model. That way the, the unit has some height variation, looks a little more realistic and visually interesting. You can deploy these tricks as you see appropriate. But I hope these, this basing composition has been interesting to you. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to give it a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe for more hobby cheating in the future. And as always, see you next time.